take your calls on 0800 234 6565. India, by the way, now all out for 274. Uh, Virat Kohli made 149 in the end. Uh, just before I introduce our special guest this evening, a couple of quick texts for you, Lee. Um, Bill in Darlington says $6 million. So if that was the city wish, playing a key role in hopefully the revival of Sunderland Football Club with just two days to go now until the start of the League One season. Executive Director Charlie Methven has joined us in the studio. Good evening again, Charlie. Good evening, Simon. Uh, thanks for coming in again. Good to have you. Um, since you were last here, I think it was a couple of months ago, wasn't it, you came in with Stuart. Um, have you settled on that title of Executive Director? Because at the time you said you weren't really sure what you were going to be called. Yeah, well, that's what they, um, someone suggested it, and we r rode with it, and no one's complained about it since, so we just stuck with it. <laughs> but, yeah, I I'm a director, and from time to time I stick my nose in when I'm up here. And how have the last two months been because you knew there was a lot of work to do ahead of the season. You can't say is if you were turning around a business normally you'd say okay for six months and then let's then work out what the forward strategy is going to be going to be having turned it round. Uh, in football you don't have that luxury because the, the start of the season comes around and people expect you to compete and succeed. So you have to do several different things at once. You have to sort out your cost restructuring. You have to sort out your revenue generation. You have to sort out what your management team is going to look like, what your human capital is going to look like if you will at the same time of course you've got to try and work out what your playing side's doing and, and appoint a manager and appoint an entire management staff and then a, a recruitment team and then the recruitment team have to work with the management staff to go out and find the players and so on and this is all happening at the same time all those balls because you look at the playing side of things a heck of a lot of players have come in you've obviously got a manager in place who's had enough time to get together a, a squad that he feels will be competitive at the top of league one and and certainly in terms of players leaving and restructuring the whole finances of the club, that, that seems to be happening at pace as well. Yeah, well, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to prejudge what happens on the playing side. Pride becomes comes before a fall when it comes to competitive sports, I find. I mean, we hope and believe that we have put together a competitive playing squad, and it's one which is still going to get more competitive as the weeks go by. Um, Jack said several times that we're probably a couple of weeks behind where we'd really like to be. But I think that's probably always the way it's going to be. Probably even if even if we were two weeks ahead, we'd like to have had an extra two weeks because it's just been such a big turnaround of players. I think 21 to 22 players going out and already 11 or 12 coming in with probably another you know another couple to come. Um, that's probably double the amount of normal turnover that a foot, even a League One football club would have. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it's been a rush. It still is a rush, but hopefully come Saturday it'll all come come you know it'll come right. We are going to give away tickets tonight to Sunderland's game against Charlton on Saturday when everything gets started. So it's a big game to be at. The referee's whistle's going to blow in 15 minutes' time or so. so okay. That's all right. Yeah. Um, on the playing side, I think that it's reasonably common knowledge that we'd still like to bring an extra couple in. Um, but Jack is very, very insistent that players who come in are players who he thinks are going to improve the squad in the medium to long time. I know that sounds obvious, but I've been involved in football clubs before. There's been a bit of a you know, pile it high, get them all in through the door, and then I'll work it out from there. And there have been a few times when the recruitment department said to Jack that we've got somebody here we think's, you know, workable, um, who we think we can get. And Jack's had a look and gone, well, actually, I don't think he's going to fit in with my style of play, or I don't think he's quite the right character, or whatever it might be. So he's quite judicious in the way in which he do, does things. So the aspiration is there for another couple to come in. But at the same time, having now seen the way in which this particular manager works, I wouldn't say it's an absolute given. If, we, if, if the right players aren't available, he won't do it. But probably happy enough now with certainly the nucleus that he's got at his disposal with the season kicking off in a couple of days. And you get that vibe that he's ready, rearing and ready to go now. Yeah, but there, there, are, there are a few injuries, a few yeah. niggles, which I think you know would probably just um, caution him a little bit in terms yeah. of what his, the overall squad. Yes, I think he's starting to get comfortable that he's got the overall squad he wants. Um, when it comes to the players available on Saturday, he'd love to have three or four of, of the guys who are going to be out available. And... What was it you did want to mention in particular? Well, I just think, you know, because that is my side of the business, mm -hmm. and, and it's just been, you know, I went into the ticket office today, and we've sold 28,000 tickets already for Saturday. Right, so it should get up to 30, you would hope, maybe? We're, we're, we're absolutely looking to break the 30,000 barrier, and I came out in the papers a couple of days ago and said that it's our ambition to beat the all-time third-tier record, which is 20, 28,260-odd Man City 20 years ago. For an average through the season? For an average for the whole season in league games. Um, and I think given that this time of year a lot of people are on holiday, um, you know, some of the factories have been closed for a couple of weeks and people have been away and they've obviously got school holidays as well. We're hopeful, to, if we put a marker down by sort of getting 30,000 plus in the first game, if the team can perform 
compete, do decently and be progressive, we're hopeful that we can stay up at that sort of market for the rest of the season. It's been a phenomenal, it's a phenomenal level of support and it's not one that I take for granted. I think the record for a single game in the third tier, unfortunately, it's 49,309, isn't it? So unfortunately, <laughs> you already checked this yourself. So unless you can somehow, I mean, obviously you'd have to open the upper tier again. Yeah. You'd have to find some more seats from somewhere as well to a couple, actually beat that. A couple. We so, probably just have to stick a few more in the director's yeah. box on people's knees. And try. I mean, if things were going well, obviously you probably would find that, that yeah. it might be near to being possible. I mean, you know, Marco uh, knows well the crowds there. Lee's played at the Stadium of Light as well. I mean, you played in a promotion season there uh, from the championship and yeah. it was pretty much a full house, wasn't it, every week? Uh, the place was rocking. I think we had the fourth biggest gate in the country. Yeah, and that's that was right. including Premier League teams as well. So yeah. the place was rocking every, every every home game. You've always said, Marco, haven't you, that it doesn't matter what division they're in. If they start yeah. winning games, it's very quick to turn around from an atmosphere of doom and gloom, which was only to be expected because of the last two seasons. Things can change so, so quickly, can't they? Well, I'm looking at probably for Charlie, this is the the big the side of the, the, the club that he's more interested in at, at the moment, but one doesn't go without the other, so no. it, it, it's, you know, we're absolutely sick of walking over the over the bridge with our heads down, our hands in our pockets and our chins in our chest, because it's not been fun to watch for, for recent seasons, and I think just to see smiles on faces will mm. translate into bums on seats, and... Yeah. and I think that will then, it'll be like feeding a fire, you know, I think you've got, I saw the, the, some of the pictures of the lads training on the, on the stadium and some of those lads, they'll, they'll have maybe never played at a stadium of, of that capacity or, 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 or passion really and, and so it's going to be a new experience for some of them, they're going to have to hopefully enjoy it but then, you know, if we can create a, a winning mentality and, and that fortress mentality that managers often talk about I, th I think you know we we could have an amazing season, and, and Charlie, it'll make your job very easy, I would think. Yeah, I, I mean, look, you're absolutely right, Marco. It'd be sort of foolish to think that uh, attendance is dissociated from playing performance. Clearly, that is the single most important factor. But mm -hmm. as a marketeer, you have to look at it and say, well, I can't control that. Um, all I can control is making sure that the rest of the match day experience and the way in which the clubs presented and the way in which the fans are communicated with is as good as it possibly can be. And if you're satisfied that you've done all that, then you know what? It's funny how often then, if you're being professional on that side of the club, it's funny how often you get rewarded with some performances on the pitch at the same time. And when those performances do come, you're then set up to really take advantage of them. Whereas I find that sometimes clubs that get lazy around the marketing, the commercial side, tend to get punished in some way because it reflects a culture of mediocrity throughout the whole place. Well, if, yeah, we'll avoid that. Yes. Yeah. If you want to give us a call tonight, uh, have a chat. Charlie, are you okay to stay till the end of the program at seven? Or yeah, sure. No, I'm, I'm around. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, oh eight hundred two three four six five six five is the number. Let's have a chat to, to Colin, who's a Sunderland supporter and is on the line now. Hello, Colin. Uh, good evening, lads. Uh, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hi, Colin. Colin. Good, yeah, good evening. Yeah. Uh, just before I go on, um, Simon. Yes. I had a word. Uh, I, I, I sent a text on Tuesday. And I, I, when I rang up uh, last night, uh, I spoke to the chap, and I said, uh, I sent a text out, and it was, was never on the radio, you see. Can't read them all out, uh, unfortunately. No, no, but I'm saying, it's unfortunately, yes. uh, it was regarding the shorts. Ah, the shorts. I've got that on my list yeah. of things well, to ask Charlie, yeah, actually. Yeah, actually, I, I, I can go back to uh, the 60s. I, I watched Sunderland play. They always yes. played in white shorts. Uh, I think it went uh, and go back to the 50s, I think. In uh, it was only shorts. in the okay. 70s. Yeah, they played in white shorts, mm -hmm. and it was only, I think, I'm not sure exactly the, t t the time they changed, but into the 70s they went to black shorts. From then on, that's what they played in. Mm -hmm. So, for, from, 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 say, from the 50s and 60s, or even before that, uh, they were played in white shorts. Right. And that was the, the text I sent. So, okay, <laughs> so uh, right. the big question is, what colour shorts is it going to be this season, red or black, Charlie? Because, um... I've heard two different stories here. Because there are two different answers. <laughs> so basically what happened is we, we inherited um, a, a choice of kit for this season and next season, um, and that's the contract with Adidas, um, which not only has the Adidas backs of the shirts, which I, you know, like most fans wouldn't ideally have, but also they decided, um, and this was a matter of choice from the club, that they would play with red shorts this season for a change, presumably because they thought it's different, therefore we can sell more of them would be the natural reason to do that. Um, when this decision became apparent, we had, I just had an email back from um, our now managing director, Tony Davison, and it just said, Sunderland playing black shorts, full stop. 
Um, so we then, went, we, we then went into a bit of yeah. backwards and forwards with Adidas and then with the Football League because we'd already declared, all well, the, the, the club's management, the previous management had declared that we were going to play in this, you know, red and white stripes and red shorts. And we asked the Football League, well, can we change that? And they were helpful um, and said, yes, yes, you can. Um, the problem is, is our away kit is all black and wouldn't actually look particularly good with black and red shorts. So it's going to be a little bit of um, sort of um, ad, ad hoc decision making, I think, as we go from game to game. The aspiration is to wear black shorts at home, um, but there will certainly be matches away where we do wear red and right stripes and red, sh- uh, and red shorts, and there'll be matches when we play in the all black. Um, it's going to be a bit of a mishmash, but we're, we're aware that most Sunderland fans, and we actually had this, we surveyed, etc. Most Sunderland fans expect Sunderland to play in red and white stripes and black shorts. Well, Colin wants you to go back to the yeah. 60s now. White shorts, don't you, Colin? Yeah, yeah, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, uh, Charlie. You can't please like everybody, question. Charlie. Oh. Hi, Colin. Uh, sorry? You, you got another question very quickly? Go on, then. Yeah, yeah, quickly. Uh, basically, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this season because I think uh, what you've... What's happening is what should have been done years ago. Uh, I, I hope it's going to be uh, a good season. As it, it seems as though everything's moving in the right direction. So, because I've supported them for about 50-odd uh, f- years. And uh, it's, uh, it's been a bit drab the last few years. So I'm hoping uh, this season will go better. And I think uh, part of the reason is because of the way things have been. And, and more like a, a new room sweep and clean, I think. Well, I, I, hope, I, hope, I hope you're okay. right, and, and Colin, thank you very much for carrying on following the team after all these poor years. Thank you very much, Colin. Thanks for coming on tonight. The number's 0800 234 6565. Um, another question that keeps coming up, and it's something again that we've discussed on the show, Marco, the music to run out to. <laughs> I think you mentioned when you were last here, <laughs> weren't you, that um, maybe it was time for a change. So will there be a change? Will we hear a change on Saturday? Uh, there have been whole areas of the business where I'm told you've got no say over that, but this is one where I'm unfortunately I've told everybody else that they have no say over it because um, okay. I, I hold strong views on it and I don't think it can be put out to, to poll. I think you've got to take a view on what atmosphere you're trying to create and what music you're trying to do that with. Um, I discussed it with the manager, who's a music nut, um, some, <laughs> some weeks ago, um, and we both felt that we want the start of the match um, or the run-up to the match to be, in a, in a nice way, an intimidating atmosphere for the away team um, and for the away team to feel, crikey, we're going out into something here where the fans are getting quite pumped up and where there's, everyone's going to be quite on our backs right from the start. Um, so we uh, chose some tracks which we felt sort of, you know, would, would create more that sort of atmosphere. We did a big survey with the Red and White Army, 10,000 people entered it, and a sort of narrow... Uh, about 41% said so we'd actually quite like to keep Prokofiev's um, dance the night. So we've kept it, but just shunted it back a little bit. Right. Um, so it's not the run-out music, but it happens very shortly before. Um, and then you've got a, a, a bit more of a mix in the run-up, which is, uh, I think, slightly more conducive to, to creating the kind of atmosphere that the, the a home team... So you're not going to say what it is exactly? We're going to well, wait and find no, out on Saturday? Uh, only because I don't want to spend the next two days answering <laughs> rabbit criticism about my music taste. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, Lee, when you were at the club, it was just when Prokofiev was brought in, when the Stadium of Absolutely, Life was first yeah. created, wasn't it? And that certainly, you know, at that time was something a bit different, wasn't I it? I think it was the players inside the strips that uh, yeah. got, the support, <laughs> got the support as excited. Probably that ball. <laughs> Obviously, I'm just saying. It was the music, I think. Uh, which, which, which was the players, right. inside the, the players inside the black shorts got them yeah. excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which was my argument in the middle of last season when someone brought it up, right, wasn't it? it yeah, it, it doesn't matter what you run out to, it's about what you do when you're on the field. But yeah, I, I, it, sometimes yeah, it does need freshening. But, you know, I think Everton still run out to Z cars for, for you know, the last I 40 d- years. I just think it's the last few years, hasn't it? It's been a bit of a, a downer for the supporters. And they're looking at uh, any little way that they can change things. And with the, the new ownership of the football club, there's a feel good factor. So this could possibly be the time to do it, you know? Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's exactly our feeling. Is it's, it's not there's anything wrong with the way that things were done before. It's just that if we're going to start doing things a bit differently, now's the time to do it. Yeah. Should, should we start guessing then? If it's Tony Blair's, things will only get better. I'm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking, walking straight out the stadium. <laughs> well, I've heard a little whisper that you know you've got, you've got history in terms of your music, you know, and you've been known as you know. Play a few tunes now well, again. Actually, um, so, 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 so it started out in radio, so um, before realising that um, only great geniuses ever make it in broadcasting. Correct, and obviously. that I was uh, <laughs> going to be much better suited to being a grubby print hack instead. 
Okay, well, we'll wait to see what it is at the weekend. Anyway, uh, thank you for clarifying that what you have been able to clarify there. 0800 234 6565 is the number to call. Charlie Metford, I guess, in the studio. Lee Clark is in for Steve Howie tonight. Marco here as well. Uh, just coming up to 25 past six. Here's Total Sport on BBC Newcastle with Simon Pride, Lee Clark. I almost said Lee Howie in, mixing up two of them there. <laughs> uh, Lee Clark and Steve Howie. We haven't got uh, Lee Howie in tonight. Um, uh, Charlie Bedford's our guest. Marco Gabbiadini's taking your calls as well as ever. Um, and this season, we... <coughs> ...have tickets to give away for every single Sunderland and Newcastle United home league match this season. So that is the sound you need to be listening out for. Uh, call 0800... 2346565 if you are not doing so already and I can see plenty of you already are um, and you could win a pair of tickets for the game at the weekend Sunderland against Charlton Athletic you'll find out firsthand what the music is going to be that uh, will be played out before the match and then more importantly you'll see Sunderland's first match under Jack Ross their first match in their League One campaign uh, so yeah terms and conditions can be found on the BBC Newcastle webpage I should tell you as well that calls are free. Let's then see who's going to be first up. I can see the phone lines are going nuts, but no, just being told. Michael, good evening. Hi, you, Pratt. How are you, Pratty? Very well, thanks, Michael. Thanks for coming on this Hi, evening. Hi, Michael. How are you? Are you excited about the weekend? Um, good to see the football back, but uh, we're unknown, unknown at the moment because I mean a lot of players are going to really know that well, but having said that, we didn't know Kevin Phillips or Mark Moore, so... Yes. OK, well... Optimism is a good thing. You get the question I'm about to ask correctly. You'll be able to give an assessment of the match first hand. You'll be there with um, a companion of your choice. All you've got to do is get this right. I think from what you said there, mentioning mentioning a certain uh, player, not Mark with the uh -huh. other one you mentioned, I think you might, you might be you might able to get this. I Lee will know the answer to this without any shadow of a doubt. Sunderland famously drew 4 all with Charlton Athletic Saturday's opponents uh -huh. in the 1998 Championship playoff final at Wembley before losing on penalties. I'm not going to ask who scored the hat-trick for Charles. I'm not going to ask who missed the penalty. The question I have for you, Michael, you is... Them. Did you? Uh, the question I have for you is who was in goal for Sunderland that day? Perez. Lionel Perez? So I was actually watching the match. Trying to it's actually debatable whether he was in goal, by the way. <laughs> I know. Very debatable. You made a mess of one of the... I think you made a mess of one of the headers, didn't you? I, I think you made some comments uh, similar um, uh, Yeah, I don't time, think yeah. he was as polite as that, by the way. Yes. Um, probably a game that should have won. Yes. Um, so so, so, you, so that was bad timing, that, wasn't it, for you, Michael? I know. Uh, still, I was trying to watch the match. Trying to be quiet in the house, jumping around. <laughs> It was, I mean, I just got back and bowled an hour before the kickoff. I think it was. Well, well done. You're going to be there at the, at the weekend. Is your, did your daughter grow up to be a Sunderland supporter, presumably? She is. I've, I've dragged a couple. Of, my, my son's, he's the one. And he actually had his first season ticket last season of all seasons. I mean, I've had season tickets in the past, but this was his first one. He's actually uh, went out and says, I want a season ticket for last season. So, and he, he's getting one for this season already. Anything you'd like while you've got the chance to put uh, Charlie Metford as well, executive director at the club, while you're on? No, I'm just I'm, I'm uh, happy with the change. I think we need it. Well, you obviously need the change. I just wish him all the best. I think I think we've started off well. I think, like Margot said before in the past, I think um, we'll start and get a good good feel uh, back to the stadium. And, I mean, the last two or three seasons, I mean. All the matches I went to last season, I, I didn't see one win. Right. I was counting up. I think, yeah. I, I but there weren't many. There weren't many. No, no. no it was only three wins. Was three wins, I think, at home. Uh -huh. uh, and I, I didn't see them once. <laughs> right. Well, hopefully that will change at the weekend. Thank you very much, Michael. Stay on the line. We'll make sure that we get your oh, details and you know how to pick up those tickets. And one thing you have to do, Michael, is give us a call on Monday next week and give us your views on the match, OK? OK, I will. That's one of the unofficial terms and conditions uh, of the competition. Um, and I guess that's a challenge that you've got, Charlie. It's people like Michael that maybe had season tickets, but now they're maybe just going to take it match by match, which is completely understandable, isn't it? Um, see what the fair is like on the pitch, and then hopefully you'll attract them back again to 
getting season tickets in the future. I, I think that it's entirely understandable that people, after experiences of the last few years, I think was, over the 10 years, Sunderland lost 28 more games than any other club in Britain. I mean, that, you can say it quickly and blithely, and it all sounds fine, then you actually think about it. They lost 28 more games than the next least successful club in Britain. Unbelievable stats. I think at one point um, they sort of won five home games in two or three seasons. I mean, these are the stats that most home fans haven't had to put up with, frankly, in decades. So it's actually entirely understandable that people have said, I want to see how things go, and almost less understandable that the, amount of the sheer number of people who said, actually, I want to put some faith behind this. So we're hugely, hugely grateful for it. I mean, let's just try and imagine that 30,000 people have turned up are going to turn up on Saturday to watch a club that's been losing continuously for years. I mean, that's just a vast, vast sum of people. I mean, clubs, very well-supported clubs like Newcastle. I remember when Newcastle were going through a tough time under Aussie Yard Dealers in the early 1990s, and I came up here with Oxford United, my hometown club, and there were 10,000 people in St James's Park that day. It's not easy to carry on supporting your club when it's doing really badly. So to have that sort of, that, those sort of numbers turning up on Saturday is just quite mm-hmm. extraordinary. Lee might have been playing in that game. Possibly was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Two all. Yeah. Foggy, foggy day. Probably, yeah. Uh, played on the and, and things turned around quite quickly. Oh, oh yeah. That, well, it yeah. just shows you the change. It's with the two clubs. You're, you're talking similar things. I think uh, we talked about it off air. The, the feel good factor around Sunderland now, and Mark was mentioned it as well. They get a couple of good results in League One. They'll need to open the top tier again because the fans will come flocking back. They want to just see. They want to see at five o'clock on a Saturday. They want to be walking home or going into the pub or celebrating three points. And uh, if they see that and they see a group of players who are delivering that on a regular basis, the stadium will be full once again. Lots of people are texting in about music and about shorts. We might have a chance to go back to those issues, but we'll try and move it on a little bit as well if we can. We've got Charlie Metford then in the studio with us until 7 o'clock this evening. This is Total Sport. We'll have the answer to the guest with Graham question. Metford, if you're a Sunderland supporter, about what is ahead this season for the football club and everything that they have been doing behind the scenes, Charlie and Stuart Donald, the new owner. Uh, you can also talk Newcastle with Lee Clark, who's in for Steve Howey uh, this evening. Marco is here talking to Sunderland as well. Um, and Rafa Benitez says it's time to act more than talk when it comes to bringing in new players not a happy man you'll have heard his interview on the show earlier this evening after last Charlton on Saturday Tom Flanagan is injured the defender so he'll miss the match Dylan McGeeck is a doubt and lead of just 22 for England going into day 3 with one wicket already down in their second innings Elsewhere, Durham are taking on North Ant, 81333, start your message BBC, and you can tweet at BBC Newcastle, use the Total Sport hashtag. Total Sport, the all... Great. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how Thanks long, a lot. I don't know how long it'll wait for you, but um, <laughs> it's going to be there for you. It won't be go. waiting long once I'm in there. And, uh, yeah, lots of people texting about the shorts. Um, Jack says they were actually changed to white in 1958 and then to black in 1972. Thank you, Jack, for clarifying that. Um, and there is one subject matter that people are getting in touch with us about as well. Um, regarding two players that haven't been at pre-season training but probably should have been, Papi Gilaboji and Didier and Dom. And it's something we've been discussing on the show through the week. Um, what can you do when players not only don't want to play for the, the club, it seems, but actually aren't even showing up for training at the club where they're employed? It's actually quite a complex legal situation. Um, and I think people might remember a few years ago the situation with Chelsea and Adrian Mutu. Because it's not just a matter of do these players get paid, it's also a matter of um, the obviously the capital capital value damage that's happening to your asset base to talking boring financial yeah, I see for the, yeah. for the European one, yeah. Yeah, I guess if you more time. I think probably yeah. the biggest the biggest problem, Charlie, is as well, it's it's the energy that it takes out of the club as well, isn't it? And and, and Jack's reflected it brilliantly so far. I don't think he want, he's trying not to get too involved in it, but we've had it with recent years with the Jack Rodwell situation, but it, it just just sucks the energy out of the club at times, and we don't really need that at the moment, do we? But yeah, I, big, look, big it's, it's not ideal. It's not ideal. No. Um, in some ways, the fact that they're not here, I think, makes Jack's life a bit easier. If I'm, uh, yeah. let, let's be candid about that, mm-hmm. um, because if you have players who are here, as we had for two or three weeks, we had a player who was in training, but who had said specifically that he did not want to stay, well, that's a harder situation for the manager to deal with, because obviously, even, even just the things at lunchtime, your squad's having lunch alongside somebody who said that they don't, they don't want to play with them. 
So, it is a complex situation. It's not mine to sort out. Um, it, Marco's right in saying that would we rather not be worrying about these backward-facing issues and necessarily be facing forward? Of course. But we knew what the scene was when we took over. And I think if people had, I think if people had said to us that we would be where we are right now... Yeah, you've, I think you've got probably... You've, you've resolved more problems than some people thought you would by yeah, this stage. But, but yeah, well, thank you, Marco. And that's, if someone had given us our current situation when we took over... We'd have said we'll uh, we'll take that De- decent decent result. Thank you for your text. We'll come back to some of them later. Eight one triple three. Start your message with the letters BBC. Coming on the scene. Thanks for being a good Samaritan. All those yes, years. Thanks for me for it. Cheers. <laughs> ah, you're welcome. Cheers. Thanks. Now. Thanks very much for coming on tonight, Charlie. There's somebody you know, listening to that who's running a football club. I mean, obviously you're at a different level with Sunderland at the moment. The ambition would be to get back to the Premier League at some point sooner rather than later. I mean, does it scare you when you hear those sort of figures being thrown around now? A, a team like Crystal Palace, which you wouldn't normally associate with being one of the, the biggest spenders in football. They spent a lot of money on Marco once upon a time, actually. But, uh, you know, when you hear that they're spending, or they're paying £175,000 a week to a, a single player, I mean, it, it's, a, it's almost it's a daunting environment to be trying to get back into, isn't it? Well, given the amount of money we're still paying some players who don't even want to pay for us, no, it seems quite sane to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, I'm being serious. We're paying people 50, 60 grand a week, and they don't even want to pe- be on the pitch, and the manager doesn't want them on the pitch. So, um, no, obviously the, the numbers have got very significant. But if you look at the overall financial environment, um, it's pretty much uh, commensurate with the overall financial environment of Premier League football. So, I think probably 10 to 15 years ago, Premier League football was a very difficult place economically for clubs, whereas now you're in a situation where the majority of Premier League clubs make profits, um, and that is because they're competing in the player market with other leagues for these top players that simply cannot afford to compete with even Crystal Palace. So it's got to the point now where Premier League clubs can outbid the continental leagues for players and still remain within their financial budgets. So the numbers are huge, the numbers are very big, they're not as big as in some industries, I mean a lot of my day-to-day businesses in financial services where the numbers are far, far bigger than that. It seems huge because it's one individual person getting it, but in, if you look at the overall income that, com- that comes into the Premier League, it's actually still within the bounds of sanity. A few more messages coming in for you as well. Um, this one's from Johnny. Thank you for all your hard work since coming in and making a positive change to the atmosphere surrounding this fantastic football club, Charlie. That's from Johnny. Um, and this one is from Paul. Uh, Paul from Bristol, actually. Um, a question for Charlie. Have you watched the BBC documentary Premier Passions uh, made about Sunderland's first Premier League campaign and then their move to the Stadium of Light? It'll tell you everything you need to know about Sunderland's fans, and it was a great insight into the commercial side of the club at the time, uh, says Paul. Yeah. Not sure where you can watch it I'll, nowadays, but have you seen it? Have I you? watched it at the time. Ah, um, okay. I watched it at the time. It, when I was at, it was around the time I was at university or towards the end of it, and I had um, Mac and friends who got me into Sunderland a bit when Oxford weren't playing we go and watch Sunderland and um, so I watched it and I remember it really really clearly lots of different bits of it and there are people at the club today who are around when it was taking place back Tony Coates and I had a recruitment was in, in the squad at the time and we're now going through exactly the same thing with Netflix um, yes there's uh, a documentary being made hasn't there from the season just gone so there's a documentary that's been made from the season just gone that comes out in October and it, basically what happened is it was meant to come out in August and the film the footage went into California and Netflix said this is so good, we're going to make it one of our main primetime uh, slots in the, in the fall instead. So, okay. uh, this is going to be a projected audience, just to try and put it's going to be a projected audience of something like 50 million people watching. Uh, have have they continued the filming? What? Charlie, have they continued the story on then? Uh, so, uh, basically, the, the, the Netflix bosses came back to uh, the production company in this country and said, look, this is, this is such a good story that we want to make, uh, as we want to make it season two. So they came to us and said, will you do it? And we looked at it and spoke to all sorts of people around the club. Most of them said, um, Stuart and I looked at it and discussed it with Juan Sartori, and we decided, we're going to do it. You don't often get the chance to project no. any kind of sporting enterprise to 50 to 60 million people around the world. And um, Well, I'd rather watch that than Love, Love Island, that's definitely for sure. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> well, I'd be fascinated to watch it. Yeah, Nick Barnes, our son that commentated. He yeah, he's a mainstay, he's, he's, apparently. He's, 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 yeah. They did a lot of filming of him, so goodness knows what yeah. he's been coming out. He's probably wondering what he's... Been saying it now. I think it's, uh, a, it's, it's a new job covering baseball coming down the trap for next. <laughs> it, could, it, could be, it could be the way forward for him, so yeah, that <laughs> will be. They don't do tweed at the baseball, Charlie, that'll never happen. <laughs> Marco and, and Lee, I know you weren't, I mean, it was after your time at Sunderland, Marco, before your, your time, Lee, when uh, 
the film Premier Passions. But I mean, yeah. what's that like for, for players? I don't know if you've ever been in the situation where the cameras have maybe come into the dressing room. I mean, I know <sighs> some of Peter Pete's team talks became infamous because uh, you heard every single word of them, and Bobby Saxton as well. Well, there's, in. there's been times when I've been a manager where in certain cup competitions and certain competitions that you're involved in that they, they do come into the dressing room and uh, have a camera in there at half time, etc., etc. So there's been that situation but I think you just get used to it it's you go about your normal business um, you do your job and uh, as long as they don't interfere with that whether you're playing or managing or in another part of the club and you just you just crack on with it but uh, I, I think it gave me a little bit of an insight because I was I'd already yeah because Pete had already spoke to me in the January to try and get us out in Newcastle and uh, that season they went down but uh, so I, uh, I I just had a a little glance at it to see what I was possibly putting myself in for. Total Sport <laughs> on BBC Newcastle, it's 10 to 7 and this one from Mike says the way Charlie speaks is an absolute breath of fresh air I would absolutely take uh, being in League One, having this reset rather than scraping along in the Premier League uh, with the directorship they have at Newcastle uh, Can I ask Charlie though what the plan is to change, it, or if the plan if there's a plan to change the concourse areas in the ground because they can do with a bit of TLC. Well you've sorted the seats out now you've got to go behind. We haven't sorted the seats out yet. The, 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 we've some sorted of some of the seats out, and the rest of them get sourced out in the autumn um, as, as, as the manufacturers deliver them effectively. Uh, so part of the survey that we did, uh, which had quite extraordinary 10,000 people responded to, uh, one of the clearest answers was they wanted to have artwork relating to Sunderland's history around the concourses. Um, and we've been speaking to a very well-known um, what do you call them, a graffiti artist, street artist, who's, who's well known in Sunderland, um, about designing those um, scenes and then getting uh, qualified Sunderland fans together with him involved and then actually doing the painting. So that's, that, that's going to be starting in the near future. Look forward to that. Let's bring in Sam, who's on the line, Sunderland fan. Hello, Sam. Hi, uh, evening, gents. Hey, Sam. Hi, Hello, Sam. Sam. Uh, the question, Charlie, was just how, has it been a hard challenge so far in terms of trying to make Sunderland? more financially stable whilst also making sure Jack had a good transfer budget. That, that's a challenge. Um, it, that, that is, it precisely sums up the challenge. And it's, when you boil it down, it's, it's actually more simple than it sounds. You have to reduce costs, increase revenues, and at the same time enable the manager to have the time and, and the money to be able to compete financially in the league in which they're in. And those three things sound like the three bits of a jigsaw that don't fit together, but actually that they do. Um, because a lot of the costs that are involved um, that we've uh, reduced are not central to the playing side. In fact, I would say weren't central to the marketing or the commercial side either. They were costs that have gradually grown up over time in a rather fat and lazy sort of lack of direction at the top uh, type of way. In terms of the revenues, they really hadn't been focusing on revenues at all. When we came into the club, there wasn't a single person selling commercial sponsorship. Not one single person in the business was selling commercial sponsorship. And the view had been really well, look, the amount of money that comes in through TV in the Premier League is so big that what's the point of selling a 50 grand sponsorship or a 100 grand sponsorship? Well, I'll tell you when it's your own money, that, that, that really, really counts. Um, so by bringing in a commercial guy as managing director, he's now restructured the whole sales side of the club um, to make it far more focused around local business and, and really engaging with that. I've restructured the Marcom side together with the comms team um, uh, and Louise Wanness who runs that to make that much more fan focused um, because the previous uh, leadership as we all know was not particularly focused on fan communication and already the revenues are increasing very dramatically and that's not because we're geniuses, it's a, a pretty plain. You have to speak to people, get them on board and try and get them to uh, enjoy spending more money with the club whether it be a business or a person or, or whatever it might be. The cost reduction has been painful. There have been obviously jobs lost, and I don't, you know, can't hide from that. That's that's it hasn't been hugely commented on the media, but it has been on in terms of social media. And it, it's no reflection on the individual's concern. It's a reflection on the lack of leadership the club's had over 10 to 15 years. That the club ended up employing almost tw two, almost twice as many people as Newcastle United, which is clearly a crazy situation. And when we had to try and rationalise that for the long term good of the club. So it is difficult getting all these things working at the same time, but healthy, healthy businesses and healthy football clubs do have all these things working together at the same time, and we're really trying to make that happen. We'll have to leave it there, Sam. Sorry to cut you a little bit short, but thank you very much indeed for your question. We're almost out of time for the programme this evening. Um, guest with Graham's on the line now. Hello, Graham. Hiya, Simon, Marbo, Lee and Charlie. Graham, Hi, Graham. it's good to have Hello, you back. Graham. Well, there was a lot of, there were a lot of conversations, much. a lot of conversations over the course of the summer as to whether to, to retain you. 
you know, I know how charming it feels, to be honest with you. It's, these executive decisions have to be made, but we thought that, you know, <laughs> um, after everything you've done for us and, and, and the programme and the popularity that you have and the fact that people, you know, shout answers at you on the street these days, don't they? You've become an integral part of the show, Graham. So for the same fee that we've always paid you, um, we'll, we'll have you back. I think he's quit. He's overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> Any reaction to that whatsoever, Graham? He has gone. <laughs> Is he there? It was such such a big intro as well. It was, right? it? Uh, so, yeah, it was big. He wasn't it was big. big. You went, you went too speech. big. It's yeah. a, uh, okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'll play his question down. I hope he comes back. Hi, this is Guest with Graham. Here's tonight's question. England won a penalty shootout at the World Cup in the summer. But can you name the 13 players who have missed a penalty for England in a penalty shootout in the European Championships or World Cup tournaments? It's covering six games. So 13 players. Um, at this point, this is the point when um, Graham should be on the line to give us the answer. He's gone. He's, um, he's completely he's disappeared. Um, what we can do is start naming. I, I know a few of them. <laughs> Um, so we can, we can make a start and then I'll put them to Graham when he comes back on. Uh, are you into football trivia like this, Charlie? Absolutely. Feel free, feel free to join in then in that case. What we'll do is we'll go round in turn. Um, Marco, you can go first. Can I go first? Can I? Mm -hmm. oh, okay then. Well, uh, uh, David Batty. David Batty? I'm, we know that's Pretty correct, sure don't we? Did. Yeah, I'll write yeah. Down. Oh, Graham's back. Hello. Graham. Hello, where have you been? What happened? Did you hang up? I was giving I you a big build-up. what happened, but anyway, I heard David yeah. Batty there, yes. I was giving you a huge build-up. <laughs> right, OK, David Batty, Marco, you're correct. Uh, Charlie, you can go next. Uh, Paul Lins. Same match, Argentina, yeah. 1998. Yeah. Well done, good effort. Lee. Chris Waddle. 1990, West Germany. Right. Gareth Southgate. Oh, you're right. going to go on, go on Yeah, I'm going to go next. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Gareth Sorry. Southgate. <laughs> no, I won't say, I won't say that. I'll say, I'll say a different one. I'll say a different one. Um, Stuart Pearce hasn't been said yet, has he? Yeah, 1990, West Germany. Okay. Marco? Um, I'll go with Southgate, then. I'll go with my original. 1996, Germany. And Charlie? Crikey. The pressure's on now. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I was going to go for Stuart Pearce. Um, Trying to think, what, what tournament did we go out in most recently on penalties? Um, Most of them, Charlie, help I think. Help me, Lee. Go for something more recent. One, the penalty shootout that we actually won. Uh, Jordan Henderson. Yeah, well done. Ah, good yeah, good. in the summer. We're going to have to be quick now. Jamie Carragher. Through. Yeah. Carragher. Jamie Carragher, yeah. 2006, Portugal. There were two others in that same game. In Portugal in 2006. Right, okay, so I'm going to go for one from the same game. Stephen Gerrard. Yeah. Yeah, and one other. Just that become a manager in the championship. Just chat about now, fellas, because we're Frank short time. Lampard. Yeah. Frank Lampard, Darius, yeah. Darius Fassell, did he miss one? Great answer. Two, 2004, Portugal, yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's smart. What about that Italy game as well, um, more recently? Ashley Cole missed one in that. Oh, yeah, that was a... Uh, yeah. Uh, Ashley Cole, who And Ashley Young. Yes. Oh. And you're just, you're just missing one. 2004, Portugal. Spend it, like. Ah, David Beckham. Beckham Thank you very yeah. much. Yep. Cheers, Graham. Thank okay, you, Lee. Thank boys. you, Charlie. Thank